This talk is about designing with our ears and for our ears. Uh, this is a, an important aspect, and the architects for many, many years have focused almost entirely on these. Most architects are concerned with how things look. They have very little training on how things sound. And therefore, many of the buildings that we occupy may look great, but the experience of being in them is not so good for the ears. We spend time in restaurants like this, shouting over the top of noise like this because all the surfaces are hard and easy to clean. Or we sit in a 40 million pound aeroplane with somebody speaking through an old fashioned telephone set through bad loudspeakers and making us go like this. Why is this? The effect on us is very serious. It's not good. It affects our health, it affects our productivity and our behaviour. All of those things are changed by this kind of sound. And most people, as a result of this noise, have this kind of relationship with sound. We just don't think about it. We bear it. And yet sound has four major effects on us. And I just want to set today up by sharing these four ways with you before we talk about sound in education. Here's the first way. Now, that was quite gentle. I hope your alarm clock doesn't sound like that. Sudden noises are not good for you. It gives you a shot of cortisol, your fight-flight hormone. Sound is affecting your hormone secretions all the time. Also, your breathing, your heart rate, even your brain waves. All the rhythms of your body are affected by sound from outside. So if I put this on and leave it, you would start to feel more relaxed. Your heart rate would go down. Your breathing would slow down and so forth. Sound affects us physiologically. Second way, psychologically. So we all know that music uh, affects our mood. Music, however, is not the only sound that affects our mood. Could we have some more volume, please? That's... Thank you very much. There's also sounds like birdsong, which make many people feel secure because we've learned over hundreds of thousands of years that when the birds are singing, things are okay. It's only if the birds suddenly stop singing for some reason that we realize that something bad is about to happen. That's not a good feeling, is it? Something bad is going to happen if the birds suddenly stop singing. We use birds song a lot in the sound agency. Third way sound affects us cognitively. If you're listening you can't to this understand version of two me, people on talking the at the same time, or in Try this case, to one the other person one. talking twice. Even a woman cannot understand two people <laughs> talking at the same time. I'm sorry, but it's true. We have bandwidth for roughly 1.6 people's conversation. So if you have to work in an office that sounds like this, and you hear somebody's conversation, then your productivity is very affected if you're trying to think about words in your head. In fact, open plan offices can be that destructive. Now, not for everybody, and not in all situations, but we do need quiet working space as well as open plan space. One size does not fit all, and sadly, many architects and interior designers think we should all be open plan all the time. The fourth way sound affects us is behaviorally. So if I were to put this sound on and leave it for the next eight minutes, you would all be probably leaving the room. We don't want to be in sound like this. What we do with unpleasant noise like that, if we can, is we leave. That's what we do. And for people who can't leave, noise is extremely damaging. I don't have time today to go into the numbers on the effects of noise just in Europe. If you want to check it out, have a look at the World Health Organization website, and there are some truly horrifying numbers there. In education, we tend to focus on sending. Well, we also have to be received. And I have a whole TED talk about conscious listening and the need to teach children how to listen better because we are losing our listening. But we're not here to talk about sending and receiving today. We're here to talk about the context for sending and receiving. That context is normally a space like this, sometimes well-designed, sometimes not well-designed. In that space, you have acoustics and you often have noise, and they form a circle which can create a noise that goes up and up and up. That kind of effect happens if you have a badly designed room. When I see a classroom that looks like this, I have to ask myself this question. And the answer is, in many cases, sadly, they do, but they don't use them. 
This has an enormous effect on the way that students sound. A typical schoolroom, when there's group work going on, is a very loud place. I have to shout to get over the top of it. This study was done in Germany, and it showed that the average noise level in a schoolroom in this study was 65 decibels. That's loud. I have to shout to get over 65 decibels. Also, more worryingly, the noise level as it went up and down caused the teacher's heart rate to go up and down too. Now, if you work in 65 decibels regularly for long periods of time, it has a very serious effect. I just draw your attention to this section here. The possible noise-induced risk of myocardial infarction. That's a heart attack through long-term exposure to 65 decibels. So teachers may well be damaging their health by working in this noise all the time. Not to mention their voice. There was just a teacher in the UK who sued the government because she lost her voice. She was shouting so much every day. And there are many other effects of noise. If I zoom in on this, you can see that you have stress factors which apply to teachers. And the health impairments, tension, headaches, stress hormones, you have performance impairments, like losing short-term memory and concentration, and hypertension and heart attack, potentially. This is serious. It's serious for the children, too. A study in Florida found that if you're sitting here, where this photograph was taken in row four, then you're getting just 50% of what's sent because of the noise of the room in, in Florida, naturally, air conditioning. Over here, it would be more heating fans and maybe fans from projectors like that. This room is not silent. And many schoolrooms have a lot of equipment in them, making a lot of noise. That's a very worrying number. If you like an education to watering a garden, which I think is a fair analogy, we are wasting a lot of water. And particularly for three groups, who have it very tough. Children with impaired hearing. On any given day, there are a small number who have a permanent hearing impairment, maybe 2%. A much larger number have got a cold, or flu, or glue ear, or an ear infection. On any given day, roughly 16% of ch school children have got a hearing impairment that day and they find it even harder to hear. The second number there is, well, that's English as a second language. OK, here, German as a second language. There are a lot of children who are learning in their second language. And finally, we have introverts who find the whole thing of group work very difficult anyway. Uh, there's a fantastic TED talk by a woman called Susan Kane on that topic, if you want to check it out. You'll hear a little bit later on about the Essex study. This was done in the UK. And it found that by damping down rooms, now reverberation time is not the only factor here, but it is a big one, by damping down rooms, making them less reverberant, children could hear better, their behavior got better, and the results got better. So all of those things happened, and it was a bigger effect than they expected because of a thing called the library effect. As you damp a room down, people start to get quieter and quieter in a spiral again, just as we get louder in a spiral. The cost of doing this in a classroom in the UK, roughly two and a half thousand pounds. And I spoke to the guy from Essex Council uh, when we did this event in London. The cost of sending a child with a hearing impairment out of his area for a year when they don't have a classroom that's suitable 90,000 pounds a year. So you treat a classroom once for 2,500, or you spend 90,000 on that. The benefits are very, very clear from the Essex study and from the other work we know. Behavior improves, learning improves, and the health of the children and the health of the teacher are greatly improved by improving the acoustics of the environment. So to conclude, these are the things that I said in London we need to do, and I still believe we need to do them. High standards of acoustics in classrooms are essential. Many of our classrooms are simply not fit for the purpose. That means low reverberation time across the spectrum, as well as other acoustic 
factors. We need to police those things and enforce them, not just have a rule, but go and see is it being put into place. We need to remedy the problems in our old buildings and build good new buildings that really do, uh, really are fit for purpose. And we need to inform and inspire parents, not just the professionals, but also the parents need to know about this because they are the people who are going to make a big fuss if their children are only getting half of their education. And finally, we need to teach architects that it's not enough to design appearance. What they need to be designing instead is experience in all the senses for all of us. That's what sound education is all about. And uh, just as a parting shot, uh, in London we launched an app which you can get for your children or for yourselves. If you have to work in a noisy place, uh, you can get this app. It's called Study. It's available on iPhone and Android, free. And you can put it on, and it's masking sound that's designed to help you to work. So sound education is a serious enterprise. I welcome you all here today. I think we're going to have a fantastic conference, and I hope that's set some context. Thank you very much.